outside. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Should be able to see the PowerPoint. Um, so this is the third stewardship series for this year and the final one. Um, stewardship series started in 2017. Um, it was an in-person thing where we did a workshop and kind of went over um, with that purpose to go over the basics of um, uh, land management and skills that are helpful for people who want to take care of their own land, but then also skills that would be helpful to help us on our land. And um, since we are a small staff, um, volunteers are always very helpful. Um, and I, my name is Sarah. I'm the preserve manager with Little Forks Conservancy. I've been with Little Forks going on four years. Um, I will admit that I did not study trees specifically. I do have a degree in biology, um, but some ways that I learned so much about trees, um, practicing in the field using ID books or apps. Um, I went through um, training and through the Maryland DNR for tree care and chainsaw training. Last year, I went to a talk um, with uh, Janet. I'm not really sure how to say her last name, um, and I won't butcher it. Um, and she runs a website called Garden A to Z. She's out of Ann Arbor, and she does a bunch of work with, um, well, one gardening, but she just knows a lot about tree roots, and that was the. It was through Relief Michigan, um, and she talked about properly planting trees and all the things that can go wrong if um, roots kind of go different ways. Or, um, and I'll go into more detail on what she um, taught me. A variety of conferences that covered all sorts of details about these about uh, tree pests um, and tree ecology um, and then a variety of other DNR trainings, um, uh, even through uh, the Forest for Fish program with Mike Smolligan uh, uh, out of the DNR. Uh, he's taught a lot about forestry. And then the Eyes on the Forest program for the wo Women Owning Woodlands with Julie Crick. Uh, through MSU Extension, and then uh, Claire Conservation District Forester, Nia Becker. Um, we work with her a lot, and um, she is the local forester that goes through Claire and Gladwin. And uh, one thing that I find important for environmental education is kind of once you learn stuff, continuing that knowledge on and sharing it. Well, kind of what today is. Um, so the basics of tree ID um, to kind of get you started, because there's usually, if you want to go ID a tree, oftentimes there's like a dichotomous key that leads you through all these little characteristics. And sometimes they don't define those characteristics very well. So I wanted to uh, start there and then we'll go over some of our common trees in the area, just looking at their leaves and pointing out those um, little details that can help you narrow down what kind of trees you have. Um, and leaf structure to me is the easiest way to ID um, because when you look at bark or the, the buds at the end, sometimes the buds are not low enough uh, for you to reach. And then sometimes the flowers or fruits or nuts, they're not present when you're trying to ID them. And the buds, it's a lot of like little shapes that could go one way or another. Um, so 
there is a way to do it, especially like in the winter time. Uh, there's a few books out there specifically for IDing trees in the winter. Um, but when it comes to leaf structure, there's a lot of uh, definitions that um, that I'm going to go over. Um, so leaf structure, there's uh, two main ways that a leaf um, grows on a tree, and it's the positioning along the stem or branch. And there's alternate, meaning they're offset, or opposite, meaning they're growing from the same point on the stem or branch. And then the other um, kind of exception is uh, compound leaves. That's when they're in a um, cluster together. They grow um, in a, that one is, you can help ID a compound leaf tree by like the number of leaves per compound, but then each compound leaf or leaflet um, that will still grow in an alternate or an opposite. So you're not looking at the compound itself, you're looking at how each of those compounds grow on the branch. Um, and like I said, number of leaves per cluster is important. Um, and there's actually very few um, trees that grow as opposites. Um, the acronym that is often used is madcap horse. Uh, so you got your maple, ashes, dogwoods, um, can't remember what caps meant. I did not write it down. And then horses, like your horse chestnut. Um, and then you go into, once you determine if it's alternate or opposite, um, you go into leaf characteristics. So there's the simple, um, where it's just kind of an oval shape. Or you have lobed, where it's like um like oak leaves. Those are considered lobed, is when there's kind of a shape to them. And then once you figure out if it's simple or lobed, then you go down and you look at the edges. Do they have little teeth or big teeth, or are they smooth, which is also called entire. And sometimes, uh, depending on the book, toothed can also termed serrated, um, like a serrated knife. Um, so covering the common trees of our area, um, I'm definitely probably missing a few uh, trees, but some that I see quite often. Um, you got uh, your red, and you kind of can see in this image here that little differences in the depth of the lobes. And that's kind of your, um, or how um, toothed it is. So your silver maples are really easy to ID when you get a hold of a leaf and there's that, those deep um, lobes in them. And then your red maples are kind of fatter versus your sugar maples are a um, little thinner with the lobes. And then not pictured is box elder, um, which is a type of maple, kind of grows everywhere like a weed, but it is native to Michigan. And then they kind of have leaves similar to um, poison ivy actually, where it kind of in the middle is like a, it's got the two nubs and then kind of the nubs face down, uh, which that's an easy way to figure out if you're dealing with poison ivy is that little hand gesture. Um, so bark felder is kind of deemed invasive depending on who you talk to because it just grows like crazy, um, but so do and fast. Um, a lot of other maples do as well. And then you got your oaks. There's like 12 species of oaks. Um, but our most common ones are the red, white, um, swamp and pin. And then on this picture, we also have burr or black. Um, so your reds are kind of fatter um, here and pointy. And then your whites have those deeper lobes. 
And then the swamp is kind of more like a feather to me, like the outline of the feather. These are considered simple. Um, I like to term them heart-shaped leaves um, in terms of a red bud, which is pictured here. The leaves are literally heart-shaped. Um, they are the ones that have the pinkish flowers in the springtime and then those heart-shaped leaves. And then they end up having these little pea pods. Um, and then we've got uh, cottonwoods. Those are the ones that make it snow uh, in the summertime. Um, but they kind of got this somewhat heart shaped and they got those teeth. And then one of those uh, characteristics is these little pods that produce that fluff. And then we got two types of aspen um, are quaking, which kind of have these little teeth and kind of more round with the little point. And then our big tooth, which as you can see, they're pretty big teeth um, coming out of there, but so that's heart-ish shape. Well, the quaking aspens are the ones where on the underside it's like all white. Um, so, and like when it's windy, you can kind of see them really clear as day. Um, and our more oval shaped ones are beech trees. There's the American beech. So it's got these nice deep lines and that main one down the middle. And those ones are smooth. And then we got our blue beech, also termed muscle wood. It has very similar leaves, um, but its key characteristic is actually its bark. Its bark has those ribbings like a um, muscle um, when you get down into the like, um, like underneath the skin kind of muscle, or if you're really, really strong, I guess. Um, and then our birch trees, um, we mostly have yellow or paper. Um, yellow, I added the bark in these ones because they're really um, distinguishable and when you're in the forest. And then you can kind of see the variety of leaves just in birch trees. You see this more skinny, very serrated uh, leaf from then that kind of shredded um, papery bark. An uh, interesting thing about yellow birch is if you get a hold of a twig um, and you scratch the bark off, the under layer has a peppermint smell and taste, and you can actually like chew on them. Um, and then our paper birches, um, that signature white, um, beautiful bark. A lot of people like to um, harvest that bark and use it for crafts and stuff. And then our river birch is less common, but it's definitely uh, a unique tree. It's kind of got more of a cream color and then it's got that flaky, um, flaky bark. So I included it in here. And the leaves are definitely a little bit different in shape. The main ones that are compound leaves that you'll find are ash trees, which there's green, white, and more or less, less common as black ash. Um, but our green and white ashes are what's been really hit hard with the emerald ash borer, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but that the ash tree has about nine leaves in a compound, uh, depending on how old it is. Some of the younger ones, you only see like um, seven, so that's pictured here. And then our walnut is a really long compound. Right now they're, um, they have their nuts um, out, which look like tennis balls, not the walnut that you're used to in the store. They have these really long fronds. And then our locusts, uh, there's a honey locust, 
uh, which is native to Michigan, and they have these much smaller leaves, um, and then they're still compound. And these ones have kind of like those long pea pods that in the fall. And then uh, characteristic of ash trees is um, in terms of their bark, which is really easy to tell them is they've got the, um, they have little diamonds like in the ridges, they make little diamond shapes, um, which isn't super common amongst other trees. And then now a lot of them are um, dead. So that's another easy way to tell um, what it is. But that once you look at that bark, if you see a dead tree and you look at the bark and you just see the diamonds, that's like key indicator that it's an ash tree. The more common ones, um, there's a few neighborhoods in Midland that I've seen that sycamores are planted along the street. So I included them in, but they're definitely uh, less common in this area or right on the edge of their growth, their uh, range. And they have kind of that maple leaf look, but they're wider, not really lobed. And then they have these funny little spiky um, seed balls that hang down. And then of course, sycamores, they flake off their bark. So it kind of has like this camel look to them depending on the year or the time of year. And sycamore trees, their leaves are generally a bit bigger than your typical maples. And then catalpa trees, you can see here, these are also very large leaves. Um, I've seen quite a few uh, planted in the area and they have really beautiful flowers that kind of look like um, um, kind of like an orchid-ish. They're white and like a little bit of purple on the inside and they smell pretty good. And then they also have like really long pea pods that come out afterwards. And then we have some really funky leaves. Our tulip tree got this weird shape. And they, in the springtime, form um, this little leaf cluster that's like bright orange, and yellow, and it looks like a tulip. And that's how it's got its name. And then sassafras, the characteristics is this plain leaf, the mitten, and then like a chicken foot or a dinosaur foot. And it's pretty much like the easiest way to figure out what it is, is to see um, that kind of dinosaur foot leaf. And then our mulberries also have like multiple different lobe leaves. Um, and they, um, they have a lot of berries right now. I don't know if it's old enough. But it's a key indicator if you're looking at something that has all these different kind of leaves, it's not like one type of pattern. That's a pretty good indicator is the mulberry. And these ones are uh, toothed versus uh, sycamores are smooth. And then our coniferous trees, the um, native pine trees are um, white pines, red pines, and jack pines. White pines are easy, they have those white kind of soft needles, and they're always in sets of five. And you can remember that by there being five letters in white. And then red has a uh, red pines have much longer needles. And they're really pointy and kind of sharp versus jack pines have very short needles. As you can see over here, they have the shortest. And jack pines are kind of, when they grow, their branches get all like twisty. And it just looks like a root. And it doesn't grow to the same height as red or white pines. Um, your red pines will have that kind of reddish uh, flaky bark. And it usually grows really tall. And then there's a whole bunch of space where there's 
no branches and then at the top there's a cluster um, and then white pines are generally um, depending on spacing really they will have branches all the way through and then we have two significant invasive pines and the scots pine has got kind of short ones like our jack pine but bit longer and definitely shorter than the red so it'll be an easy way to um, identify them and then the Austrian pine is very similar to the red pine and often gets um, accidentally planted um, when they're clustered together or put in rows um, but it kind of has a, it doesn't have that red bark um, when it is older that's the way to tell between those two. We've got our white cedar, which still has needles, but they're kind of flattened like scales and kind of more fern-like structure to them. And then the little tiny clusters of dense clusters of uh, pine cones and they dry out. Hemlocks, um, they're kind of the really short needles and they're, they lay flat on the little branches. And then they have the little baby pine cones. And the, the bark is kind of like a dark brown versus the cedars are that shredded. Um, our, we've got firs and spruces. They look very similar when you're just looking at them, but the easiest way is to reach out and touch them um, with a friendly fir spiky spruce. Um, so you kind of reach out, and if they're nice and soft, you got the fir. And usually it's a Douglas fir, and occasionally a balsam fir, but I think around here it's mostly Douglas. And then the native spruces are the white and the black spruce. The black spruce have short needles. And then the white spruces have those kind of medium length needles. Versus our blue spruce and Norway spruce, so technically not native to Michigan. And those blue spruce, obviously, as it's named, blue, blue needles and those um, Norway spruce looks like it has longer, the fronds of needles, but longer than the black spruce. Other trees that are commonly used in landscaping that's actually not native or occasionally invasive are those blue spruces, uh, black locusts. Um, I think the reason people use black locusts is because um, locust trees, like the honey locust, will have on its bark, um, on the trunk and the branches, it'll have these like intense spikes that come out. And the black locust doesn't produce those spikes as prevalent. They're, I think, much smaller. But they um, produce flowers. They have a pretty aromatic smell. And I believe they have smaller seed pods versus those honey locusts that just have these really big ones. And people don't like dealing with them or cleaning up after them. Um, so that's why they've used the black locusts. Our Norway maples are often used. They have a wider um, leaf than the red or the sugar. And then the tree of heaven looks very similar to um, to walnuts or sumac, but these ones are um, smooth. They have smooth edges with like a little nub. You can kind of see it on that one, or a few of them. A little nub on each leaf, which has a scent gland. And they, I have not smelled them firsthand, at least not to my knowledge, but they smell like uh, rancid peanut butter. Um, 
the people, I don't know why they wanted Tree of Heaven, <laughs> um, but apparently it smells. And it's good if you're out in the summertime and notice the smell, evaluate your tree. Um, so this is kind of where uh, one of those things that I learned from uh, Janet <laughs> um, from Garden A to Z out in Ann Arbor. Um, she um, is working with Relief Michigan um, and she was doing a series of talks and she um, talk about properly planting trees. And one of the things that's been the big push is to stop mulch volcanoes because it is commonly used just like everywhere. Everyone piles on this mulch because um, they think they're protecting the tree. Um, but really you want the mulch to go around to the drip line of that tree, um, whatever the size is when uh, you plant it and then I guess you make it bigger as it, gets, as it grows. And then leaving that space right next to the tree uh, dirt so that it can breathe and have um, ex be exposed. And then sometimes when you have this mulch pile around, it also kind of helps the water go towards the tree. And when you uh, plant trees, you want this flare. As you can see in this photo, um, you don't want that trunk to go straight in and then have the dirt. You want that proper flare out. Um, so when you go to, which I'll talk about in a second, when you go to plant, you want to make sure that first root is level with the soil and not buried. Um, but one thing that can happen when you do mulch volcanoes or when you improperly plant a tree is roots can kind of go a little haywire and go and even wrap around the tree, which it kind of self girdles the tree. You can end up killing it. Um, usually it's kind of evident that it's doing this or something's wrong is if the tree is suckering, which means it's sending off um, like emergency shoots from the base. Um, it's kind of like its last stand to exist um, is to sprout out from the base of the tree. And when, if you come across a tree like this, you can kind of chisel out that tree, tree root that is suffocating it. Um, but our, the talk that I was out with, that Janet led, um, she had all these stories of how she would save like these trees in these neighborhoods and she would like excavate these roots out and fix them. <laughs> and it was amazing. Um, so planting trees. Um, if you're going to plant trees on your property um, and you let's say you're doing a sapling, um, you want to make sure that you trim those roots um, to make sure they'll fit straight into whatever hole you dig. Um, and then so you don't want them to fold upward. You don't want that J because there's some trees, there's a tap root that um, needs to go straight down. So if it's wrapped or bunched, it's going to have trouble growing. And when you go to pack in the soil, um, the reason you don't want to dig too deep is you don't want any of those air pockets because then you're going to have a dry root. And then, like I said, you want to place that tree so you find that first um, kind of lead root as you go down the stem and make sure that stays level um, with the soil. So then when it gets older, it has that nice um, uh, kind of roots kind of spreading invisible. And when we talk about the, um, what's it called? There we go, root flare. Um, we don't want, we don't necessarily mean the, those trees where like all the roots are exposed. Usually that's because people have been walking on it or um, a lot of traffic that's worn away the soil. 
and the um, net, that ends up compacting the roots. Oftentimes, if you come across an old tree and those roots are just all exposed, um, those roots are actually so compressed and probably no longer functioning. Um, so you don't want that kind of exposure, but just kind of that base layer. And then if you get happen to get a bigger tree, like the ones that are in the burlap ball, um, you want to dig a hole um, that's pretty wide. Like you want it to be the width or the how deep the burlap is, um, like that ball. But you want it to be pretty wide so you have room to um, room to work, and then kind of room to like fix any of the roots if you need to. Um, a lot of times when you get a tree from a um, a landscaping place, um, they often put a lot of mulch or extra dirt on top just to help keep that moisture in. So you really want to um, remove those layers and find that root flare before you put it um, put it in the ground. And then you want to make sure you remove, of course, the burlap. But also sometimes places will have this like caging around it that kind of keeps its form. And you definitely want to remove like all of it. Uh, some people say just like cut a few um, places and it'll be fine. Um, but you're just putting that all in the dirt and that's just going to affect the tree later. And another thing that some um, tree growers do when they're working and the, they start from pretty small trees and they sometimes have to up the size of their um, pots. Uh, what some people end up doing is when they put it in the new pot to get them all the roots in, they end up kind of doing the swirl motion. Um, so kind of evaluating your tree for that and make sure these roots aren't in like this like tornado of a position because then you're gonna wanna like fix that. But definitely, if you plan on uh, doing a lot of planting of trees, um, check out Relief Michigan, and they have this tree planting resource that has all these images and down to details. Uh, there's another type of tree to plant, which is just uh, bare root, um, which I didn't really want to get uh, into that. Um, it's usually a larger and then bare root, and probably many people wouldn't be doing that type. But or if you know of anyone who plans to plant a tree, definitely direct them to that website, which the link is in here, and I'll include in the email after this. Uh, Mary asks, what's the best time to plant a tree? Usually in the spring when uh, you're gonna get nice rain um, afterwards, so it can establish. You don't want to plant a tree and have a, a drought like we've been having right now, unless you have, if it's near your house and you have the ability to water it, um, then you could really do it anytime. But you're in the springtime when everything's growing is a great time to do it because it's kind of um, stimulate that growth. And then the other time, if you miss that springtime, Doing it in the fall when things are going dormant already um, is also a great time because the tree that you're planting is also preparing to be dormant because um, it's been going through those same <clears throat> those same like wintry stresses. Um, so even though it's in a pot, it's still gonna be in that same timeline as the trees around you. Um, so the spring or the fall. And then once you get your tree or you're dealing with older trees and you want to trim the branches because um, they're in the way or dying, um, there is a proper way to prune trees. Um, usually it's called a three cut method. So you want to do a little notch. And then you want to start cutting from the top of that notch down. So that little notch kind of gives the space for that branch to start to fall without tearing. Because that's one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to um, be cutting a branch down and then suddenly have it 
fall and continue tearing. And then it leaves like um, you know, that branch holds on to that little piece of bark and just tears it all the way down. That's gonna leave the tree open for uh, diseases. And then, so you do the little notch, the cut through, so that gets rid of that weight. And then you wanna go through and you wanna cut um, You want to cut as close to the uh, trunk if you're cutting a whole branch as you can. Um, so then it, that tree can form um, called a collar around it. And you might have seen it on trees um, just walking around in the woods. Um, and they just form this kind of protective collar and growth around these old branches. Um, so if you leave that extra branch, like let's say you just cut it say, and you leave that nub, it's not going to be able to heal properly. If you're trying to cut down a one that's um, one that's already dead you want to cut, it's going to start forming that collar already. So you just kind of want to cut right in front of it. And then that way it can finish healing. A lot of conifers have that collar already forming um, because some conifers are self pruning, um, like they will grow in their lower you'll find a lot of conifers like those lower branches are like always dead. And that's just kind of a way for them. That's the way they grow and then a storm will happen or someone will run through there and they'll just snap off. And that's pretty normal. Um, so just making sure you were like, or acknowledge the collar if there is one and just make it as smooth as you can. And the same thing goes to if you're just trimming uh, smaller branches off of a larger branch, you want to make sure you cut um, kind of with, with the branch so that can heal as well. It's kind of a similar concept. Like you wouldn't want to cut in the middle of between these two. You wouldn't want to cut just in the middle and leave this weird like inch or so because that will just Kind of trigger something in the tree and then it can end up actually killing like the entire branch and then you're going to end up needing to cut that entire dead branch down or that dead branch then falls on your car or in the middle of your lawn or hopefully not your house um, or a power line you know it leaves a lot of hazards so when you want to uh, trim a tree up you want to make sure you look at how the branches are um, are being um, split off and look at that network and kind of sometimes it makes your life easier and you can find okay these multiple branches all come from here I'll just trim this one off versus of oh chop 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 um, so it's important to look and then because in these trees a little extra biology for you is that all of these nodes, there's like these stem cells that kind of help stimulate this growth. So you want to, um, if you cut in the middle, you're just cutting off that new like growth and it's going to signal a warning to the, the tree. Now I would suggest using a handsaw um, for most trimming. It just ensures that like if you're um, using a chainsaw, Sometimes that chainsaw can um, can nick another part of the tree, then you're just creating more work. Uh, versus a handsaw, you can kind of have that control, hold onto the branch, and you do those cuts. If it's a really small branch, um, like the three cut is definitely like a sure bet you're doing it properly. But if it's a small one, you got a good hold on it, you can just cut straight down. Um, uh, to create that collar for the tree. 
Um, and lappers, uh, one thing to avoid is making sure they're sharp. Um, one thing I don't like using about lappers is go to cut and you end up having that one little sliver of uh, bark left and it just won't cut. It's like trying to use scissors on something and it just folds. Um, so I like using hand saws better for this kind of stuff. Once you know what kind of tree you have um, in your area or in your yard, if you just have one, then you can kind of learn about, okay, what's, what's out there that could harm my tree? Or what warning signs should I look for? Um, what things not to do to avoid the pests to come? So there's a, quite a list of bugs or fungus um, that are threatening our trees. Um, only two of them are just like in the United States, they're not in Michigan, but these other top five are around and have been wreaking havoc on our trees for a while. And so we'll go into a little bit more detail about them. So the emerald ash borer, a small green bug, you can see up close in this picture here, but adults are actually smaller than a penny. And unfortunately, the emerald ash borer started in Michigan. So we're kind of already past that point of uh, save the ash trees and kind of a what do we do now phase. But to know um, that that is what killed your ash tree because um, it is likely dead already unless the city has been treating it, um, which you can tell if it's been treated if you look at the base of the tree. Usually it has to be like on the road, um, like that space in your grass between the sidewalk and the road. And you look at the base and there will be little taps at the base of the tree. And those are like the injection points that they leave um, to make it easy to come by and do it again. And they'll do like this, um, this treatment to keep the bug out of them. And so we still have a few ash trees in, um, in Midland. So it depends on what neighborhood like you visit. Um, but the key indicator, um, if you're talking to someone who's in a different area and emerald ash borer are um, just starting, uh, you can tell them to look for uh, D-shaped exit holes. So a lot of these bugs, what they do is they um, they end up uh, laying like their eggs underneath, just underneath the bark, and then their larvae feeds on that inner part of the tree, which then um, oftentimes in a tree, the only part that's actually functioning is that outer edge. Um, so that inner part is just kind of hardened, it no longer works, but the outer edge is what transports the food and the water up and down the tree. So when these larvae eat a bunch of tunnels, as you can see in this photo, oops, um, they eat through all that because they want those nutrients in that water. And you might be wondering, like, okay, I'm seeing ash trees, they're small, but I'm seeing them. Um, uh, emerald ash borer are really only like trees that are bigger than four inches because um, they have enough nutrients and space for them to really survive. Beach bark disease has been in Michigan for a while. It's kind of started in the UP. Um, it's definitely wiped out so many beech trees. Um, and an early sign is what's in this picture is you just kind of see these white flecks on the tree, um, which is from a beetle and a fungus. Um, and then this tree, like a lot of other, it prevents that um, sap from blowing up and down. 
and then it takes three to six years for the tree to officially die. Um, but one problem with this is that's pretty hazardous as it could be like still partially alive and a big old storm can come through and it'll just like knock it down and oftentimes it's like halfway up in the tree that it decides to split. Uh, and there aren't any official treatments. Um, some sites have said to, if you see, like catch it early, just like rub the scales off um, with a brush or like high pressure water. If, you happen, if it happens to be like near your house, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's a little out of luck, unfortunately, but it'll be around for three to six years. And in the meantime, it'll spread its seed at least. Um, or um, horticultural oils, um, they can suffocate the bugs that bring the fungus. And then some people call it beach scale. But there is no insecticide that can prevent it. Hemlock woolly adelgid is a small little bug kind of like aphids, um, they kind of cluster on the stems. And then they leave behind this white residue. It's kind of waxy. It's meant to protect the bugs um, from predators. But it, um, it can end up killing the tree. It takes quite a while. It takes four to 10 years. And it, there is a well-known insecticide that can be applied at the soil or at the base of the tree. We have in the soil at the base of the tree and then the roots kind of uptake it. Um, and it kind of acts like a front line for the hemlock. And then there's other ways um, to inject it, similar like I was talking about with the emerald ash borer. Um, with injecting it into the base of the bark of the trunk. And it'll protect it for a few years. Um, and you can, if you see it, you can do it preemptively as a way to make sure it doesn't get it. Or if you find it early, you can start treating the, tr the trees um, for it and it can get rid of them. Like rid of the woolly adelgid. And then if your hemlock is on its own, uh, removing it is um, another way to prevent it from spreading it to others. If you're in like a stand and you see, oh, this one has it, uh, cutting it down would probably just end up transferring them to the trees nearby. Um, so really just like treating the soil, unless it's near water, then you don't want to use an insecticide near water like to directly into the soil you'll want it to be injected which you'd probably have to hire someone I'm guessing to do that. And if you follow environmental groups on like Facebook or something you've probably seen this bug a gajillion times on uh, the last year. Uh, it was found in Pennsylvania and it is not in Michigan yet, um, but getting the pictures out there, making sure everyone knows about it is a great way to make sure it doesn't just like completely devastate uh, Michigan because these guys feed on uh, grapes, apple, hops, and other hardwoods. Um, and actually a tree of heaven is a host tree, so, um, or a preferred tree. Um, depending on what site you look at. Um, the more reason to cut them down is because these bugs like them for some reason. Um, so that's a lot of like businesses even that will just be completely devastated if this bug runs rampant. Um, so on this picture is a form of the nymph. The younger one will be all black, um, but then it becomes this red. And then this is what the 
fly it looks like. And it's got the spotted, um, speaking of fly, um, a spotted wing. And then the kind of the butt underneath um, is an orange color. And if you think you see it, uh, definitely take a picture of it. Um, refer to a, another picture online real quick to make sure and then squash it. And then we'll report it to um, the state or on um, missing, which I will cover both of those in a second. Uh, the Asian longhorn beetle, it's not really one issue with Asian longhorn beetle is it's not very tree specific. It'll go over, it doesn't care what tree it's in. Um, so it could affect uh, maples, birches, ashes, sycamore, willows, poplar trees. Um, and some of these already have issues uh, currently. Um, so the, adding this bug in would just um, wreck our forests. And this time of year is actually when the adults are pretty active, so late summer, early fall. Um, and similar to the emerald ash borer, they lay their eggs in, underneath the bark and then they come out and these exit holes, uh, they're usually like a pencil sized, perfectly round like holes. Um, so definitely check your trees um, for any of those kind of exit worms. And then in the picture is the um, beetle, which it has. There are a few species that are native to the area that look similar, um, but these ones, the antenna, are striped black and white, and they're really long. And then their bodies are really, really stripy. Um, one that you might see around is a type of pine borer. I've seen it a few times and it's got like a few white specks and just kind of long but not too long antenna and they're a bit smaller than what these guys would be. Um, like you can kind of see a um, maple leaf in the forefront in the background. So like these guys are probably like an inch and a half long. And the treatment for this is really just cut it down and burn it all and grind the stump. Make sure you don't have any larvae um, that could spread to others. Oak wilt is, has been around for a while. It's definitely like in the area. It's not well documented in Midland, but it's definitely in Clare. Uh, county and, and a real easy way to prevent the spread of oak wilt is to not cut oak trees between April 15th and July 15th. Um, when the, the trees are cut it produces the sap um, which is just like the sap that's in the tree um, and this attracts a beetle and depending on if oak wilt is in the area already it's this fungus that can attach to the backs of these beetles and that is what ends up killing the oaks is the fungus um, but it's something about these beetles that like you wound a oak and they're like just attracted to it um, so not cutting them or if your oak happens to get injured like in a storm there's um like a paint that you can do like a specific paint that can um close that wound so that the fungal spores can't get inside the tree and this is where you want to know the di those differences between the red oaks and the white oaks because uh, they're going to show them the signs differently um, red oaks will have uh, quicker reactions. They'll suddenly, like, every leaf on that tree is brown and then they just drop. And it's not even during, like, a normal time of the year. It's, like, in August that these leaves will be on the ground and you're, like, it's 
hasn't been that cool out. Um, why are my leaves on the ground? And so you'll want to look. Um, so that's the first sign is the leaves dropping off. And then the following year is this, um, like in this picture, of a uh, spore mat. Um, it's kind of, the fungus kind of built up inside and it kind of, um, kind of like creates a wound in the bark. And therefore it's attracting that beetle again because there's an injury and there's sap available. Um, and then it kind of transfers on. Your white oaks um, are much slower at, um, at showing the signs. Uh, there'll be a little browning on the edges and then there'll be a gradual loss in canopy. Like you'll have just like branches die here and there. Um, and then the uh, bad thing about this is it can transfer through root systems. You can see in the bottom of this photo um, in this life cycle of oak wilt. Another way is you have an infected tree or oh, well, it's next to another oak. It's crossing paths in the roots and now that tree next to it's going to get it. So when, when oak wilt is found, it is often cut down and then um, burned, I imagined. Um, and then they still have to um, cut the roots. Like usually roots go to about like the canopy, like the edges of the canopy, because um, that's kind of like the drip line, that's kind of how it's self-watering. Um, so just imagine like you have this big oak tree, it gets oak wilt, and then um, you have to actually excavate around and cut those root structures um, to prevent it from uh, crossing over to the next tree. And that is very uh, costly. So very easy way to prevent it. Don't cut oak trees during April 15th to the July 15th, because that's when those bugs are not most active and the sap is flowing more um, versus, um, versus paying for someone to like trench your yard. So. Uh, gypsy moth, you might have been hearing about gypsy moth recently. Um, I think I saw that um, Midland County was doing an aerial spray for gypsy moth. Um, so you might be kind of wondering, okay, what is this? Or if you're in Clare County, they've been actively um, spraying and doing traps for gypsy moth for quite a while. And it's the problem is the caterpillars. As you can see in this photo over here, they have uh, blue dots and then red dots down their back and they're fuzzy and they can defoliate trees. Usually the caterpillars just on their own won't kill a tree but it leaves them open to other pests. You have those wounds, you have those lack of energy um, available because you need those leaves to produce that um, produce the energy for the tree. And then um, it can, something else can come in and kill your tree. Um, so you got the caterpillar and then you've got the adult. Uh, and the picture is the male. They are actually the only ones that fly around and travel. Um, the females are more of a white uh, in color, but still that same squiggly pattern. And then the egg masses look like kind of hairy gobs on the tree. And this is like a significant cluster of them. Uh, sometimes they're just kind of on their own. And then um, I just recently uh, experienced what it's like to be in an area that has a bunch of gypsy moths. I went to the trails at um, in Michigan Community College in Harrison, uh, just north of Clare, and they were like 
flying around and hitting into things and it was quite annoying to be outside there or in that area and they were just like flocking around the buildings and the trees it was weird and gross um so i definitely just experienced what it's like for them to be really out of control um so definitely a reason that i'm talking about it uh, today is just because um, it is becoming more of a problem, definitely in Midland. Um, we've had a few at one of our properties, uh, Riverview, we noticed them. Um, so they kind of um, makes you want to pay more attention to them when you see how bad like they can be and how annoying it can be to be around them. Um, so a way to get rid of them um, is checking trees and equipment. Uh, for these nets and um, uh, scraping them off or smashing them and then um, putting them in like something soapy or spraying soapy stuff on them uh, will kill the eggs, like it'll smother them. Um, and then obviously smashing the caterpillars would help. And then there are traps um, for the adults when they're flying around. There's um, they can trap them and kill them before they can um, make more babies. Um, if you have like a significant problem or in your, you're in an area that you've noticed a lot of them, you can contact the local conservation district or if you're in Midland, I think it was the city was handling um, the spray, the aerial spray, and just kind of reporting that you have gypsy moth in your area to let them know because um, they'll only go based off of like surveys or homeowners uh, saying they have them because um, then once they have all that data they'll see the higher concentration areas and they'll spend that time um, applying the uh, spray or granular stuff to those areas. So if you're not communicating with those people, they're not going to know that they're there. Because um, the, in getting a plane in the air and applying granular is pretty expensive. So like they want to make sure that they're uh, using those resources in the areas that need it most. Um, so if you're in an area that you've noticed gypsy moth, uh, definitely if you're going to use a tool, or move equipment, even your own vehicle, if it's been sitting for a while, definitely give it a check. Make sure there's none of those egg masses on them because they can be kind of hidden. And that's one way to um, prevent these guys from becoming a bigger problem. Um, something that you might be thinking about of like, oh, is this the caterpillar that forms these giant nests in the trees? Um, that is the tent caterpillar, which is pictured down here. And sometimes they have like that white line, or sometimes they have, as I've seen pointed out, is a bunch of penguins down their back. If you look pretty close, they look like a line of penguins. Um, and those guys are the ones that create that tent and uh, just completely defoliate trees. Some natural diseases that can be kind of alarming. Um, tar spots, I've noticed quite a few uh, black spots forming up this time of year. It starts kind of as a lighter green speckle and then it gets darker. And then you kind of get these like ugly black spots as you can see in this photo. And this is just a fungal infection. It actually, it won't kill the tree. It won't, um, it'll go away. It's just kind of ugly and um but and it can actually happen on the non-native norways and then their silver and red maples uh, sometimes you might hear people call or term of tree is in decline which is just kind of a nice way to say that it's dying <laughs> um Usually this happens when 
like trees can live a long time. So when a tree is dying, it's kind of like, okay, what's going on here? Um, and it's usually changes in its growing environment. Um, if there's been a harvest and now the tree is all by itself in the full sun, it's going to have different stresses on it than when it was in like a forest. Um, oftentimes it's sh the shade tolerant trees that are more likely to experience this um, or there's a drought or uh, yeah like a drought and too much sun are generally what kind of causes these like I don't like this and um, kind of that decline in growth and you start losing branches and um, the canopy is a little less lush. And then uh, if you do have spruces on your land, a lot of people like to plant them in rows um, as a way for privacy. But you might notice um, like in this photo, um, kind of bare spots or kind of like a plucky stuff on the edges of the branches. And this is a fungus that happens when the trees are too close together. Um, this fungus kind of has this nicer habitat that it can grow in and it can um, cause spruces to lose their needles. Um, so if you have a spruce line in your yard or in, um, on your land, um, definitely as a, if you had just planted them, definitely keep an eye on them and thin them. Um, as they get older, when those branches start to significantly overlap, you probably want to trim like every other, or cut down, I mean, every other tree. Um, sometimes once this fungus is present, um, you just kind of have to remove all of them and to let that fungus die. And the spruce fungus can affect uh, Douglas firs as well but usually it's in the spruce family. And with a lot of your other pine trees, you wanna thin them as they get older, um, just cause they won't have room to have those branches. Um, you really don't want, especially white pines, you don't want white pines with just like a few branches full of needles near the top. It's not a healthy tree. Um, so just like if you want a pine stand, um, when you plant them closer together, people do that because they grow up um, straight and faster, um, but you want to eventually thin them out uh, so that they can become old trees and really big. So what can you do to protect trees? Um, don't move firewood. Um, usually it's across county lines. If you're near a county line, I would say like don't go more than 10 miles or so from your house, which is just an estimate that I made up. <laughs> um, just kind of uh, if you're thinking about, okay, I'm crossing county lines, how many miles do, does that usually go? And um, I'd say 10 is a pretty um, good range. And it's just to prevent, um, you know, we have these county lines, but a forest doesn't respect the county lines. So I would say it's kind of a range from that forest or whatever that you, um, that it's safe to move on. Cause you don't want to introduce bugs or fungus to a new forest. Um, and then if you see a pest or a disease, uh, take photos, uh, document like if you're in the woods like a GPS location or um, if it's your house your address and then send it to uh, Department of Agricultural and Rural, Rural Development. There's a simple mda-info at michigan.gov or their customer service. Uh, MDART actually uh, manages all uh, like the conservation districts. Um, so here's the 
uh, Michigan-wide number that you can call and report that you've seen a pest or a tree disease. Um, they'll probably have recommendations on what to do next, um, but usually the next step um, is removing the tree or treating it um, to prevent the disease. Um, citizen science is really important in terms of our forests. Um, Michigan has 19.6 million acres of forest land and about 12.3 million acres are privately owned. So early detection and reporting from our homeowners, landowners are important. And there are a few apps to learn. Um, well, Eyes on the Forest, I mentioned earlier, um, that is kind of like an adopt a tree um, or a few trees or however many trees um, and you kind of log all this information of the tree and then you check on it every year. Like you'll take the diameter and um, answer a few questions about it and it's just a way to have, you know, someone looking at this tree and keeping an eye on it. And then that is actually available through MISSIN, um, Midwest Invasive Species Information Network, which has a boatload of information regarding all the invasive species, like anything you can imagine that's invasive. Um, it might not be super uh, pre prevalent in Michigan, um, but it kind of it gives you a map. Um, you can look up a specific species um, and it's not only plants, it's also aquatic stuff. And you can see where it's been reported. Um, so if it's something else, you can see if, oh, is this even in my area? Like, am I really seeing this plant or this pest? And then it allows you to uh, report it using um, an app or the website. And you can upload a picture and describe, get the exact location and describe how like dense or sparse it is. And then there's people, there's like SISMAs um, or conservation districts that use this information, this map to then go out and do proper education or treatments. Um, so reporting it can sometimes get you um, access to resources um, some, um, depending on uh, what the state of our systems are. <laughs> um, but um, the future of trees, um, there's a lot of threats to trees. Um, we've got climate change, so that stresses to the environment might lead to more trees just dying because they're too stressed. Um, population growth of humans. Um, there's going to be, um, as we become more populous, um, the more we're going to need to spread and more of that forest land is going to be then converted from a nice forest land to a suburb. Um, and then those tree pests that we talked about, I'm sure there's plenty of other ones out there that could potentially come over. Um, so keeping an eye out for them, learning more about the pests, and then planting native trees. Um, we listed quite a few that were kind of under threat. Um, if you plant ones that don't have the threat right now, then you at least are setting up the forest um, to have trees to succeed once the others um, potentially uh, get killed off by the beetle or fungus. And just a reminder of the importance of trees. Um, of course, they give us plenty of oxygen. Um, they provide shelter and shade for these hot summers. Um, habitat for all sorts of animals. Um, like the, a fun fact is the, like a single ash tree uh, can be host to like 12 different species of lichen. Um, and some of the lichen only grows on ash trees. So like, 
um, even just a single species of tree can be so important. Uh, forests as a whole are a carbon sink. They acquire that carbon and they, um, when we call it a carbon sink, it kind of, it stores that carbon, it uses it for its nutrients. Um, and it's, it's not in the air. Once we burn our wood, um, then it's released back in the air. So having that forest land is really important. And um, those roots and the trees themselves, they kind of hold on that water uh, and they also filter the water. They help with erosion control too. Um, they slow down that flow of water through the soil because they want that water. And then um, the wood industry is a significant uh, portion of um, like of um, like DNR revenue even. Um, they um, they're pretty high up there in the money they make from their forestry. And one unique thing about um, some doing uh, select cuts is they usually make these plans in a way that provides habitat um, for something specific or um, just creates that kind of refresh for the um, forest. Um, and if you haven't noticed, um, the cost of wood has gone up and it's probably um, partly because of um, these pests that are coming through and taking out all these, like wiping out these whole species of trees. Um, so another reason to watch out for um, these tree species and to protect our trees is just because of um, next thing we know, like the cost to build something or a house or is going to go up because the ability to get those good woods um, will become more scarce. So it's kind of all connected. And that's about all I have in terms of information. There was a lot of it. Um, this recording will be available on our website and I'll send an email out um, probably next week. And this is where we can open up for questions. If anyone has any. Thank you guys for joining me today. And I guess with that, we'll let you guys go enjoy the beautiful weather outside. I know I will. <laughs>